Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's great that you've all been able to join us and welcome to the uh, Independent Scholars and the Royal Australian Historical Society members who've joined us today. This is our second uh, Independent Scholars uh, series doing research. We're having three this year. So Grace is our second um, presenter. So my name's Leslie Potter and I'm the chair of the ISA New South Wales chapter. But first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land on whatever land that you happen to be sitting on at the moment. And I'd pay my respects to their elders, uh, um, past, present and emerging. So this meeting this afternoon is in conjunction with the Royal Australian Historical Society. And I, I want to thank Philip Jawowski of the Royal Australian Historical Society, especially because he's done all the back, back work for this, to make this meeting happen. Thank you, Leslie. That's okay. And I want to particularly welcome our guest speaker, Professor Grace Carskins, who will present her topic, The Real Secret River, Truth Telling and the Power of Regional Histories. Oh. I'm sure Grace is well known to all of us as the award-winning author of the book, The Colony, the History of Early Sydney and her latest book, The People of the River, Lost Worlds of Early Australia. I think I must have written most of what you've written, read most of what you've written, Grace. I love your writing. Oh, thank so, you. Um, she's written many historical writings. So Grace is Professor of History at the University of New South Wales and is a leading authority on early colonial Australia. She also works in cross-cultural and environmental history. So it really gives me great pleasure to welcome Grace this afternoon and we look forward now to your presentation. Grace, thank you. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Leslie, and you too, Philip, for organising it. It can't be easy. <laughs> and thank you all uh, for being here. I can't see you, but I know you're out there. I really appreciate that. Uh, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the country on which I speak, which are the Cadigal, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I want to acknowledge and uh, thank any Indigenous people that are here with us today. And I also want to thank um, the Darug women with whom I am working at the moment. So Leanne Watson, Erin Wilkins, Jasmine Seymour and Rhiannon Wright, and also Dark and Young Woman, Cindy Laws. Well, in 2017, Constitutional and human rights lawyer, Professor Megan Davis, called for a nationwide program of truth-telling through regional Aboriginal histories. So Davis was ex expanding on, upon one of the three key demands of the Uluru Statement from the heart, truth-telling. Truth-telling about Australian history has to include stories of dispossession, frontier conflict and massacres, which underpinned and enabled colonization. This truth-telling is a necessary prerequisite for makarata, which I think is a, a beautiful word. It's a ilionyu uh, mata word, meaning the restoration of peace after a period of dispute and conflict. But there can't be any makarata, no reconciliation without truthfulness and acknowledgement of what happened. Truth-telling about our past is the key to our future. It makes possible a sovereignty anchored in the ancient past of this continent. But the thing about uh, Megan Davis is that she envisages more. And I'm so interested to think about the way she, she um, imagines these histories because truth telling through local and regional histories could not only tell that truth about frontier violence, but it could also be deeper and fuller histories involving Aboriginal people themselves, of course. But they could be histories that are alive to cultural and spiritual continuities, to strategic negotiations, to family and community, and to the recovery and recognition of significant Aboriginal languages, places and landscapes. Now, all of those things are precious beyond words to Aboriginal people. And I do believe there's a groundswell amongst non-Aboriginal people as well, a hunger to know this deeper history of our country. 
But why regional histories? Well, I'm going to now share screen uh, with a nice PowerPoint that I've made. Here we go. If I can get that up. Yes. Um, I think the historian Mark McKenna puts this beautifully about regional histories. In his 2018 quarterly essay, Moment of Truth, Mark wrote about his book, writing his book, Looking for Blackfellas Point. And I quote him, for the first time, history became tangible in a way it never seemed to be before. What had previously been generic debates about frontier violence or the stolen generations were now brightly lit in the everyday lives of people in local communities, end of quote. So it's at the regional scale that we can recover and observe what he calls those brightly lit moments, which is beautiful, brightly lit stories, the ways that frontier violence and resistance, the theft of toddlers and babies, the rape of women unfolded and how they affected mothers and fathers and children and families and bands of people. Regional and local histories make it real because they avoid that flattening effect of generic, broad, and you know they tend to be very abstract historical debates. And yet those debates are there because they all these histories also acknowledge the shared experience of indigenous people across the continent. It's a shared story, but it's also a regional story. I think that actually a bioregional scale, like uh, say the river valleys, or the sandstone highlands or the long saltwater coastal strip, I think they make the best uh, sense for Aboriginal history because bioregions so often overlap with the country of clans and bands. Human and more than human populations shared or struggled for this same country and were shaped by the same ecologies and soils and climates. And there's a logic to the way that people used and regarded geographical features too. We need elemental histories, histories of rivers and floodplains and mountains, stone, wood, earth, floods, droughts, floods, especially now, and of course the years of plenty as well. So on a regional scale, we can slow history down. We can look closely at patterns of behavior and reconstruct networks of human and environmental interactions, as well as conflict. Strategies, negotiations, and their outcomes over time, not just the fact, but what happened. After all, the local and the familiar matter so much to people, and for Aboriginal people, perhaps most of all, because it is and always will be their country. Now, it's interesting to note that a lot of regional projects are in fact already available or underway. All of them are collaborative projects involving Aboriginal people, prioritising their voices and stories. Um, there's so many, but I'll just pick out a few to, to, to talk about or refer to. For instance, I'm always inspired by Kim Mahood's work. Um, in, she's an artist and an author. Her work in mapping country with her uh, well Majari people of the Tanami Desert told in her exquisite book, Position Doubtful. Another example, Every Hill Got a Story. Over 100 men and women of Central Australia worked with the Central Land Council and Mark Bowman to tell the stories of invasion and violence in their own language. There are also projects focusing on artifacts and museum collections. So for instance, talking about stones, a project led by Robin McKenzie at the ANU, began by looking at all the collections of Aboriginal artifacts in local museums. In the, this is in the Riverina district, you can see them all on the map, um, which is a, just a fantastic idea. But then the team realized that, quote, every farming family has a shoebox or a milk crate full of artifacts just like this in their sheds, end of quote. And, you know, that's, I think, still true on the Hawkesbury as well, where I've been working. 
And so that project not only explores patterns of engagement between settlers and Indigenous people through that, those collections because things had been gifted or taken, but Mackenzie also organised workshops where local Aboriginal people and farmers came together to talk about the stones. So those are only a few examples of the many ways inter-regional truth-telling um, and projects and many ways to imagine and initiate practical reconciliation. And what's really struck me over the past, I don't know, 40 odd years of research and writing is the sheer wealth of historical stories and evidence in the regions. Besides the stories told by Aboriginal people, there are unique records, photographs, maps, and reminiscences in regional libraries and local history collections. I'm always stunned by how much there is. Um, it's true, they are totally dominated by settler history and settler perspectives, but within that dominant narrative are so many glimpses and stories about Aboriginal people as well. Museums, um, like this is the Hawkesbury Regional Museum collection. Um, they hold, as we just noted, both Aboriginal and settler artifacts, while I found that regional galleries often hold collections of the work of local people. And then of course, there are major metropolitan databases like AHIMS, Aboriginal Heritage Information Management System, which is an absolute treasure trove. Um, because it maps thousands of Aboriginal sites across New South Wales. And it has links to thousands of archaeological reports. And speaking of treasure troves, of course, Trove Online has made detailed historical research into newspapers and magazines possible as never before. As well as this, Aboriginal linguists and their non-Aboriginal research partners are publishing, are publishing books and word lists for Aboriginal languages in so, many region, in so many regions too. So the languages are waking up right now. This is probably the most exciting time this century for the reconstruction and resurgence of Aboriginal language and culture. And we're right in the middle of it. And I just want to mention also Aboriginal place names survive in many, many places as well, uh, still on the maps. And as, as we shall see further along, those are clues, place names are actually clues to Aboriginal geographies and ways of seeing country. So there's just some of the rich records that are out there in the regions. What, what if all of those and more could be brought together through collaborative regional projects? Well, I do have a story for you. One day back in 2017, before COVID, I was in the Mitchell Library and I was doing research for my book, People of the River, which I just have to have a little slide of here to promote it. Um, so this book traces the histories of Aboriginal people and settlers on Jarubin, the Hawkesbury River, from deep time, 50,000 years, uh, across 1788 and over the 19th century. So I was in the library reading the microfilm copy of the journal of Reverend John McGarvey, who was the Presbyterian minister at uh, Ebenezer in Pitt Town in the late 1820s. I was looking for, you know, ethnographic, ethnographic details about the people of the river and climate, and anything, anything like that. But it was slim pickings, this journal, because it was mostly just dull drafts of his letters to the paper or really, really bad poetry. But you know, you keep hoping, don't you, when you're doing research? And I kept winding the film. And then something astonishing appeared on the screen. It was a handwritten list headed Native Names for Places on the Hawkesbury River. And then there were six pages of neatly written Aboriginal place names, 178 place names. This is the first page. So I was absolutely stunned. I just stared at the screen. I actually didn't believe what I was seeing. Um, because like everyone else, I believed that those Aboriginal place names have been lost from memory forever, lost and destroyed in the aftermath of dispossession. So I, after I got over my shock, I actually quickly scanned the words and I could see that they weren't listed randomly. They were actually in geographic order. 
And then most important of all, as you can see on this picture, Mugabe often included, not always, but often included locational clues like uh, settlers' farms or creeks and lagoons. And I recognize those names, of course, because I've just been working on the Hawkesbury. So that is when I really, I think it's an extraordinary idea really dawned on me. What if we could restore these names to their places on the river? And then what if those beautiful rolling words came back into common usage? They are beautiful. Buya yoreng, merengora, ulo totemba. Could Mugabe's list perhaps be a way to begin to shift the shape of our landscapes towards a recognition of Aboriginal history and culture? Well, it was a shock because today only a tiny, tiny handful of Aboriginal names survive on the parts of Durabin between Richmond and Wiseman's Ferry, the parts the settlers went to first back in the 1790s. And, you know, after years and years of research and thinking about that long Aboriginal history of the river, I knew that there would have been dreaming stories and songlines crisscrossing that country and names for every place and major landmark. And trying to write that history without place names was really difficult. It was clunky. It felt wrong. And I now, you know, it's no wonder that Indigenous people today are so appalled and grief struck over what they have lost. And the thing is that the impacts are still there today in our everyday landscapes. Durban's traditional owners and other Aboriginal people who live in Western Sydney very rarely see themselves represented in heritage sites. This is more like what you see. There's a very strong um, sense of history on the Hawkesbury, but it's all about settler history. They don't see themselves in monuments or memorials or in everyday reminders and triggers of public memory, like place names, just ordinary things like street names, place names. The much deeper, longer Aboriginal history is hidden, it's still hidden, ignored and forgotten. And what I became aware of in working with the Darug women is that, that a widespread understanding or acknowledgement of frontier violence on Durabin, the Hawkesbury, um, is missing too. So I was actually a bit taken aback by that um, because there are so many books now about frontier violence on Durabin. Um, today, just a few, here's a few, there's a lot more than this. Um, John Connor's Australian Frontier Wars was published in 2002, so nearly 20 years ago. Then Jan Barclay Jack's Hawkesbury Settlement Revealed has a chapter on it. Um, Henry Reynolds in 2013 identified the Hawkesbury as the template for frontier violence across the continent in his book, Forgotten War. I mean, the cover of Forgotten War even has William Pigeny's beautiful painting of the Nepean Gorge with the cliffs stained blood red. And the longest chapter in my own book, The Colony, is a detailed account of the war on Durban. Three terrible pulses stretching over 20 years. Well, books are what I do and books are so important, but it seems that here at least, they haven't been an effective format to get this history across into the community or to change hearts and minds. But getting back to Mugabe's list, that idea about restoring the names to their places and maybe the words coming back into use wouldn't leave me alone, right? It just, yeah. So that usually means it's a good idea. So what I did was contact Darug women, uh, Leanne Watson, here they are, Erin Wilkins, Jasmine Seymour and Rhiannon Wright about a possible collaborative project. Were they interested? Oh, yes, they were. They were very enthusiastic about it. So we designed this project together and we were absolutely thrilled when it won the New South Wales State Library's Coral Thomas Fellowship. Uh, and that's what provided the funding that we needed. Big thank you here to Rob Thomas and the State Library. Uh, they've been wonderful. So the Darug women wanted most of all to recover cultural knowledge, environmental knowledge. Um, now we know that Aboriginal people of many different uh, language groups in this region maintained cultural and sacred rites and gatherings, as well as languages, over much of the 19th century. Much of the 19th century, they just kept it going. Um, but 
With the rise of the powerful bureaucracies, like mainly the Aboriginal protection boards, and then the punitive assimilation policies in the 20th century, language and dreaming stories of country were suppressed and lost. Could Mugabe's list help recover at least some of that lost knowledge? Place names have enormous significance in Aboriginal society and culture. They signal the meanings people attach to places. They encode history and geography. They are wayfinding devices and common knowledge. Now, often place names are part of larger naming systems, places on dreaming tracks reaching across country. They are clues to stories about important events and landmarks involving ancestral beings in the dreaming. The Darug women also wanted to the project to raise awareness of Darug presence and history in the wider community and to tell the truth about frontier violence. They had really practical aims in mind too. Say, for instance, create easily accessible resources to say train guides uh, or for teachers to use in schools, for example, or you know, a hundred other uses that that could be put to. So it was becoming pretty obvious that Mugabe's words could be more than just a list of names. It could be the key to a bigger story about the Darug and Darkinyong history of Jarabin. But to do this, we needed to put the words in their wider contexts. We needed to see the river whole. So besides connecting with traditional owners, the project explored Jarabin's history, ecology, geography, archaeology, and languages. And when we put all of that back together was when the magic started to happen. So I'll talk a little bit about how we located the place, places again. Well, we spent months actually carefully researching every one of those 178 place names. We combed through old maps and documents, farm records, lists of Aboriginal people, um, and many, many other sources. And in the end, we managed to relocate 90, over 90 now it is, um, of these names back on the map. And we have a pretty good idea about the rest were located as well. This is what we did. We just put them on a Google My Map, which was very easy to use. Um, and that was shared by, by our, uh, our shared site online. So now it's possible to say Bulya Yoring instead of Windsor or Marangora instead of Richmond or Wanji instead of Wilberforce. And we even worked out that Mugabe collected these names with his Aboriginal friends and um, informants on eight separate trips. And we actually mapped those as well. There were three of them. But we also wanted to look at the archeological record. There are hundreds of sites such as painted rock shelters, tool making sites, clusters of grinding grooves and engraved rock platforms still on Jarabin and its tributary Gunnanday, the McDonald River and in the surrounding highlands. These sites extend all through the Blue Mountains and the Wollamai, up into the central coast, round Wollambai and the upper Hunter Valley. This is a still an Aboriginal landscape and the richness of the record is just mind blowing. There are hundreds of sites, not only in the national parks, though they are very rich in them, but also in the so-called settler landscape along the riverbanks as well. I'll just show you the map that we made or a little bit of the map and how we recorded, recorded these sites. No wonder the famous Aboriginal activist Burnham Burnham said that the Sydney region is the biggest Indigenous outdoor gallery in the world. But I think the, uh, the most important part of the project was uh, the field trips, getting out on country, following in the footsteps of Mugabe and his Aboriginal friends to see how all of this comes together. And of course, for Aboriginal people, especially visiting country is a spiritual experience. They sense the past and the present converging and the presence of their ancestors, especially at their, um, their special sacred sites and, and uh, rock shelters, painted rock shelters. Well, what about those 178 words? 
the words on Mugabe's list given to him by Aboriginal people. What can they tell us? Now, that was the biggest surprise of all. We were really so lucky to have worked with uh, Dr. Jim Wafer, who's an anthropologist and a linguist. Um, Jim and I worked with the Darug team scouring dictionaries of seven local and adjacent Aboriginal languages for the meanings of these words. And that is how we were eventually able to unlock Mugabe's list and reveal a wealth of information about the world of Aboriginal Jurabin in the late 1820s. We could actually, it's, it's very complicated because every word's got, you know, a, a meaning, but overall, when we looked at the whole thing, we could actually group the words together in four interrelated categories. Um, the first one is the natural world. There's so many words denoting the natural world of plants and creatures, geography and landforms, camps and places to source material. Oh, sorry, um, that's the next one. Got mixed up there. Um, these are the this is the natural world: geography and landforms, stone and earth, and salt and fresh water. Fresh water being very important. This here's just a few words and illustrations. Um, a tiny fraction of the number of words relating to the natural world. The second group was the social world of corroboree grounds and contest grounds and camps, all different camps for different groups of people, um, as well as places to source materials for tools and implements. So that was fascinating. And thirdly, we found a pattern of metaphors, words for parts of the body, which were used to describe the river, like words like mouth and arm and finger and eyes. And they were part of words that were used, used to describe parts of the river. And finally, names with spiritual meanings, suggesting that these refer to sacred places on the river. But wait, there's more, believe it or not. When we actually mapped these names, re relocating them on country, that gave us an even more powerful insight because it traced out the way that Aboriginal people thought about Jarabin as a series, a series of zones, each with particular characteristics. I'll just talk about four of them. So on the west side of the river between Sackville and Wilberforce, here's a map where the arrow is. This is Waretcha country. We find 16 named lagoons or words meaning lagoons, including what appear to be four different words for types of lagoons. Warecha, Warang, Warade, Warakia. Beautiful words. Um, and this is where the maps that we found in the archives came in handy, as you can see um, on that early 1840s map there. This was Warecha country, lagoon country. It was rich in bird life, fish, turtles, eggs, and edible plants. Lagoons are very important places for Aboriginal people, especially for women who harvested the edible roots and shoots of water plants, such as kumbunji and water ribbon and uh, common nadu. Today, a lot of these lagoons have been destroyed or altered beyond recognition, but some do survive. Um, and, and this is why these historic maps, as I mentioned before, are so important because they show us where the lagoons were, these lost lagoons, and that's how we could return some of these names. You can see on that map there are on the left, there are four in a row. That was all one lagoon, four names for one lost lagoon. The series of place names, if we just cross over the river, the series of place names there on the east side around Cadai Creek tell us that this was Duga country. Duga country is thick brush rainforest country. Massive river flat forest once lined all of Jurabin's alluvial reaches. Other place names in this area even suggest the tree species which grew in these forests. Bulu, Coachwood, Damangoa, Port Jackson fig, Karaweri, native plum tree, and Buldora, soft corkwood. Those last two don't grow there now and they haven't been identified by ecologists, but this, this list suggests that they did originally. There are also places named for implements like, um, like Kano Gilba, 
and barambo, which are two different words for clubs, probably different kinds of clubs, and fish spears, mutting. Um, and we think that they, those tools, implements, may have been fashioned for the, from the fine timbers that grow in Duga forests in the country here. But really, I think the most significant and most evocative of all are the words which signal sacred zones on Dirabin. These are names um, indicating things like falling stars and thunder, both of which were linked with sorcery in the presence of ancestral beings. One name, Wawami, which I show here in this picture, indicates a giant water monster fish uh, with eyes staring down the river. So Wawa is a widespread word for a monster fish who lives in a deep hole in the river or in a lagoon, Wawa. Um, and me, Wawa me, is the eye. Me is a very widely used word for eye. And when we actually went to the place where Wawami was located, we noted that the rock shelters on that high cliff there look like very heavily browed eyes looking straight down the river straits here, down the reaches. There are two different words meaning rainbow place or rainbow zone, Drambuloa and Ganande. Both of these are located in places with dramatic cliffs and sharp river bends, Sackville and Wiseman's Ferry. These words are special because they're linked with Gurungadi, the great creator eel being uh, who is associated with rainbows. The Rambaloa occurs just downstream from this rock engraving of a huge eel being. Now in the wider region, Gunungurra people tell the story of the creator be being Gurungach, who was pursued by the fierce hunter Murgan, the tiger quoll. And in that desperate flight, Gurungach ripped up the entire country to create the Coxes and Wallandilly rivers. Now in that story, there are three key actors. Gurungach, probably the same as the Darug Gurungadi, Mirigan, the hunter quoll, and Bilagula, the cormorant, who dives deep into Gurungach's waterhole and tears a large piece of flesh from his back. Mugavi's list includes places, place names Balangai, meaning quoll, and Guali, meaning cormorant. These names appear close to the rainbow zone names, Durambaloa and Gunnandai. So the names on this list echo the beings of, Guringa, of the Gurungach dreaming. But, you know, they're like the tips of icebergs, so important, yet the story behind them is still hidden and submerged. But Mugabe's list has re really reconnected us to the real sacred river. And I think such words really um, remind us of something obvious and profound. It's not good enough to just add Aboriginal people's stories to white settler narratives. Aboriginal people must be at the centre of their own stories. And that's also why we have to look beyond European history and assumptions and, uh, um, and beyond European ways of thinking and towards a more Aboriginal sense of country. We have to acknowledge the belief that people, animals, laws and country are inseparable and that the land is animate, it's alive, it's inspirited. I think uh, Leanne Watson's painting, Waterholes, which was inspired by this project, um, expresses that sense of country really beautifully. Her painting represents the Warecha, the lagoons around Ebenezer and all the nourishment they, they offered people. And now we can even name some of those lagoons, Bulange, Marambolo, Kalangang. So what now? Well, you'll no doubt be wondering uh, how we're gonna publish this project. Now, I've always been interested in making good history available to wide audiences. I started out my career as a public historian. I was a consultant in history. That's how I learned to be a historian. Um, and I've never stopped being interested in that. And um, it, 
But this project, it's more urgent than ever to make the research and stories as widely accessible as possible. But as we saw earlier, um, a book does not appear to be the most effective way to convey our findings. Um, it's not out of the question, but for now, we've got three other strategies. First of all, we have published essays on the Dictionary of Sydney. Here's a screenshot. As many of you will know, the dictionary is an accessible, authoritative online resource available free to everyone. So far, we've got two overview essays all hyperlinked to places and people, um, and we plan to have many more to create a story cycle. Second, in 2020, the Darug women worked directly with the Indigenous Research Unit at the State Library to create a beautiful new exhibition, Jirubbin, which is now open. Um, here in the heart of the library, Darug stories are told by Darug people themselves. And a larger version of this exhibition is planned for Hawkesbury Regional Gallery in Windsor from August this year. And third, we are at this minute completing a digital story map with the help of New South Wales Spatial Services and the Geographic Names Board of New South Wales, who I also have to sincerely thank. Um, this map will be available at the exhibition and on the Dictionary of Sydney. And this map is where we can tie the Aboriginal stories back to the geography of Jerubbin and take the reader on a journey down the river. You can see there are nine tabs across the top and each of those unfold stories from nine uh, consecutive zones on the river from Yarramundi in the south to Higher MacDonald in the north. People can also explore this map independently just by browsing through um, the interactive map and clicking on those dots. Each of one, each, each of one will come up with information. Um, they, you'll find people using this will find um, Aboriginal place names, the green dots, the ones that we've been able to relocate at least, um, as well as their likely meanings and um, pronunciation, how you would pronounce them. There are also the names of settlers, major landmarks, as well as the eight journeys that Mugabe and his Aboriginal friends um, made. But I think just as important are the markers showing the sites where frontier violence occurred and the stories which explain how that war was fought, its impacts and its aftermaths. So the Drummond Project is about truth telling. It does tell the story of invasion, dispossession, frontier war, massacre, resistance. How can we possibly move on to regional and national reconciliation and a shared future if this history isn't acknowledged first. But as Megan, Megan Davis envisaged, there's even more truth to tell. We've been able to recover and explore the fuller, richer history of Aboriginal culture, language and country. And it says loud and clear that Jerubbin still throbs with spiritual meaning and power and shines with the ancient sovereignty of Aboriginal people. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Um, that was really well done thank you um, I enjoyed that and I'm sure our audience loved it as well in fact some uh, Colleen has uh, sent you a lovely note in the chat section oh has she let me have yes. a look excellent oh fantastic thank you Colleen yay <laughs> I, oh I forgot to say if anyone has questions I'm so happy to answer them you know I know this is a lot of information to take in but I'm very happy to answer your questions if you have any Yes, and we do ask that you put your questions in the um, in the Q and A section of the um, of Zoom, please, uh, just so that way we can manage um, them uh, as they come in. <laughs> Thanks, Amanda. Amanda's just clapped at my <laughs> clapped at her computer screen. Yes. <laughs> oh dear. 
this is what Zoom does to us, but it's all good. <laughs> Thanks again, Philip. It's yeah, it's um, it's a major thing to put this on, I think. Oh, someone else did. Joe, thank you. Yes. Oh, there's some questions. I might open them. Kathy, thank you so much. Um, Stephen says, oh, your connection dropped out, Stephen. What's the third way to make? Yes. Oh, Stephen, the third way was to, uh, it's a digital story map, which we're just finalizing now. It should be ready up and running, hopefully the end of next week. Um, and this is where we popped all the um, special information that we've discovered, the, the names and where they belong, but also the stories behind them, because there's always a story behind every name. Um, so the story map is, appears on one side, it's illustrated with photographs and Aboriginal uh, artwork, um, and it's hyperlinked to the places on the map. So I think for, if you've never seen it before, it'll be a little overwhelming to start with, but I'm hoping people play with it, explore it, and get around it. Um, I just think it's really one of the best ways to convey this very complex geographic, cultural, and language story. Uh, Virginia wants to know how to get the digital story map. Yep, it will be available at the Dirubbin exhibition at the State Library of New South Wales on a screen. I'm hoping to collect some feedback from viewers because that would be really helpful for us to kind of finesse it. Um, and eventually, once the technicals are worked out, I'm not technical, uh, it will be available via the Dictionary of Sydney. Uh, which, as I said, is a um, free to everybody to use and accessible to everyone. Um, it's also editable, so we can always add more information as it comes to light. Um, Suzanne asks, has there been any resistance from current landowners identifying Aboriginal artefacts on their properties? No. Um, I had one person who didn't want direct people on the property, but that's one person out of dozens of people who have been absolutely wonderful. And I want to thank the local people in the Hawkesbury. You know, they've made it, made, made open their properties to our team um, to visit their sites, which is the first time they've seen them, which is, I have to say, very moving to watch. Um, and I think we haven't been able to visit them all because they are on, all on private property, but that could be an ongoing project. Most people are happy to help. And I, I do think that's another aspect of practical reconciliation, um, which could, could go further. Uh, oh, I should say, this project, I think, is only the beginning. It's kind of, it could lead to lots of different ways uh, people could get together and, um, you know, talk about stones, talk about sites. But, yeah, thanks for that question. Uh, it's been actually really positive. So I'm going down. That's fine, Stephen. Susan, are there stories of adjustment, interaction and reconciliation during the initial decades, as well as invasion and violence? Yes, that's what the project is about. Um, it's The problem is invasion and violence is not recognised at all um, in the local area, um, which is, as I said in my talk, surprising, considering we know so much about it. Um, and yes, there are stories of adjustment. There are stories of local settlers who, the more detailed story is in my book, People of the River. I discovered that many of the ex-convict settlers were actually commoners from England. They weren't that interested in being greedy and taking all the land. They just wanted their patch so they could survive. And they also foraged and they didn't believe in fences. Um, and I think there were some, not very deep, but some commonalities in the way they saw Aboriginal people. And many of them shared their corn with them. They shared their maize with them partly because they didn't want to get speed or their, their farm burnt down, but um, there was some cooperation. Other people shot at them, so that wasn't good. And that caused all kinds of spiraling violence. Um, some settlers also um, learnt languages, especially young people learnt language, and they were still talking it at the end of the 19th century. Uh, and everybody knew them. They all knew their names. So there's a very deep, rich history there. Um, and we hope to convey some of that in our findings. But if you want the deep story, the long story, uh, have a look at People of the River. Kathy. Uh, early in my presentation, talk, just after talking about stones, you mentioned a reference about Aboriginal artefacts all over New South Wales, the, uh, the title and the author. Um, 
are you, I'm not sure, Kathy, are you talking about the AHIMS database? Because that's run by um, the Department of Environment and Heritage, I think they're called now. Um, that will be in my talk. If you want to email me, I can let you know about that. And talking about stones is a project coming out of the ANU, which is also online. Thanks, Virginia. Ha! <laughs> I'm not going to read that out. I'll get, I'll blush. <laughs> um, Shirley Randall, thanks so much. Strong evidence of wars. Yes. Shirley says, interesting that the Australian War Memorial in its renovations and expansion is still, review yes, still refusing to recognise that there was a war between colonial settlers and First Nations people. Can this truth telling make a difference? How can we influence? Um, so many ways you could influence write to politicians, write to your local member, um, talk, talk to everybody. Um, I also think those grassroots reconciliation initiate, uh, initiatives are fantastic too. You know, support practical help for local Aboriginal people. Like what they really need is support to get their young people to university, for instance. We need more Aboriginal historians and linguists because non-Aboriginal people can't, it's, not, it's really not right that, that, um, that we're still doing this, that people like me are still doing this. We work together with Aboriginal people, but what we want is people trained at university, um, but they, they need support, they need scholarships and things like that. That's one idea, but there's so many others. Support for schools, support for things like Aboriginal, you know, mentor, mentor, mentoring programs, things like that. Colleen. Have you thought of setting up independent website? Perhaps seek funding. Yeah, seek funding. <laughs> Have you got any ideas, Colleen? <laughs> so it's captured online searches. Yeah, well, the, the story map will be online. The uh, Dictionary of Sydney will be online, of course. I think maybe the exhibition will eventually be online. I'm not sure about that. that that'd be the library. Um, I have thought about that, but I... I am very aware of um, the short lived nature of many websites and there is nothing worse than a dead website. You really need ongoing funding. That is really hard to find, especially for websites. Um, I, I really think it's better to not reinvent the wheel with the new website, but use what's already there and interlink existing websites. Um, so yeah, it would be great, but I actually don't have time to make a website. Um, and as I said, I think we, we're proper, properly using the resources that are already there. But yeah, if you, if you know somebody rich who wants to sponsor us, Colleen, that would be really good. <laughs> um, Carwin, thank you. Yes, apologies in advance, wordy question. You mentioned that the project was around both Derek and Duck and your stories, yes. Did McGarvey's word, this is still the question, did McGarvey's word list include both Darug and Dark and Young words? Yes, it did. Could you discuss a bit more of the Dark and Young story? Were the Dark and Young people initially referred to by the British as the Branch River tribe and have more connection to modern times to the Central Coast area? Um, I don't, I can't comment on the Central Coast area, but yes, um, the Dark and Young people were called the Branch tribe because the branch was the McDonald River and the blanket list shows those the names of those people in the 1830s was still there. They also had links up the up the up the river from Wiseman's Ferry. So sorry, yeah, upstream from Wiseman's Ferry. We I am not sure where the boundary was. I'm not sure there was a boundary. I think it was a shared handover area. There would have been a lot of um, intermarriage between the two groups. Their languages are quite similar. Um, so when you say Darug and Darkinyong words, what we have to keep in mind and what came through in this project so strongly is the fact that when you have neighbouring uh, languages, they actually share 70% of their vocabulary. If you just think about that, it shows how interlinked all the languages were. Um, I, didn't, I was not aware of this before. It's only through working with um, Dr. Jim Wafer that I've learnt about linguistics and how important linguistics and language is uh, to, to understanding what we're doing in history. So um, to answer your question, yes, it included Darug and Darkinian words. It also included a lot of Wiradjuri words, which were clearly used by Darug and Darkinian people. 
So I think we have to stop thinking about languages as being discrete, bounded lists. We have to think of them as overlapping. The other thing is when you read a list of words in a dictionary, could be duck in your dictionary or direct dictionary, that's only ever going to be a fraction of the original words in that language. So because so many words were shared, you can actually often find these words in other dictionaries of neighboring languages, neighboring to that and neighboring to that. That's why this has been such a fascinating exercise. Um, and I'm very happy to answer more questions on language. There's quite a few from the Hunter Valley language as well. So Michelle, <clears throat> how long do you envisage? Oh, I feel like I'm on you can't ask that, right? <laughs> <clears throat> how long do, you, do I envisage will it take to finalize this program or do you expect it to be never ending it could be never ending yeah never ending story but I we are finalizing we do have the two essays up on the dictionary of Sydney which are overview essays um, I'm hoping to write more and you know other team members can write and add into them as well and um, the Story map will be up and running hopefully by the end of next week. Yes, which would be wonderful. If it's not, it could only be another week. It'll be a technical glitch. Um, and the exhibition is open already. So there you go. That's that's ready for you to see now. Uh, and the other exhibition in Windsor will be open in August. So um, I hope it kicks off other projects. I don't know that I'll be running them all, but there's plenty of other people who are interested. Um, I'm always here to help other people take other initiatives. Uh, the Darug women in the team and um, Cindy, the Dark and Young women, they'll have other ideas about projects which will build on this. Yeah. There is underway work on a proper Darug dictionary uh, that's going at the moment and Jasmine Seymour is involved in that and I think Leanne Watson is as well. So it's like we got the ball rolling so I'm, I'm just very happy about that. It's fantastic. Um, Alice, Pulik and Paul. Thank you, Alice. Um, could you tell us where the different country, whether the different country that the team have identified are one language group or many? Well, as I, I think I've just explained that the languages overlap. Um, it's one country belonging to Darug and then Darkening people though, I think they overlap. And is it possible to gain understanding of changes in the pre-settler Aboriginal history? Um, gain understanding of the changes in, yeah, well, we, we do that through archaeology. Um, so I'll talk about that first. The two, first two chapters of People of the River deal with deep time. So, and also geological history, which is awesome. And the deep time history reaches back at least 50,000 years. And um, the the work that's being done by archaeologists on the Hawkesbury Nepean and the Nepean and in the, uh, in the surrounding areas like um, the Blue Mountains, for instance, that does track that 50,000 year history. And we're able to link that up with the vast climate changes that occurred. These people lived through the last ice age and survived. So if we're gonna to talk to people about climate change and how to cope, I think they're probably good people to talk to. Um, so that mostly comes from archaeology. Uh, and I think the Mugabe list will probably hopefully lead to more linguistic study. We've really only scratched the surface because some of the words seem to indicate archaic words. So just like in English where you place names, we often don't know what they mean anymore, but they're old words, especially in England, you know, they have old words meaning valley or river or whatever, and they don't mean that anymore but that's what they used to mean, but they still live on in present day place names. And, and Jim thinks with some of these, some of those are archaic words that survive from an earlier phase of language. I just find that fascinating. I'm not a linguist. I can't do that kind of work, but I'm hoping somebody will in the future. It would be really great. So Gunan Day, for instance, Gunan means rainbow and Day means zone or moving. Uh, but Gun is also a, a word for uh, in another language is a word for um, eel. So you can see the link between rainbow and eel, but by the time they're writing it down, it's not the word for eel in that in, in dark and young language anymore. So yeah. Uh, Marcus, thank you. 
Yes, thank you. Long term, always re-establish re Aboriginal names. Of, yes. So Marcus says, in the long term, there are always ways to re-establish Aboriginal names of localities also in an official way. Yes. So they will be used by government agencies and the wider population. How can we make sure that local Indigenous communities can get to have an important contribution here? Spot on, Marcus. Yes. One of the first things I thought was to approach the Geographic Names Board, which I did, which is why they're making our map for us, which is brilliant. Um, so what we could do, and another phase of this project, is to um, apply for a dual naming project, do dual naming projects and provide them with all the evidence that we've collected. Um, and then um, that could be applied, you know, with signs and things like that. It's not as straightforward as it sounds because some of these names belong in places which it's, they're just localities. There's nothing actually there. Uh, though some of them apply to creeks and lagoons, so that would be good. Uh, so you'd have to do it on a case-by-case -case basis. Interestingly, the Geographic Names Board says they won't do this for towns and villages. And I really disagree with that because it's obvious that Aboriginal people had a name for Windsor. That's what, that's what the list says. They had a name for Richmond. Um, and I think, I think that's a, a leftover of the idea that, you know, Aboriginal culture belongs before 1788 and white culture belongs after 1788. And what this shows, what this list, this project and my book show is that is absolutely wrong because Aboriginal language goes on. They come up with new names for, for settler objects. Um, and to make that decision, I mean, sorry, to make that division, is actually forgetting that Aboriginal people are still here and they went on living and they went on with their dynamic culture. Um, they went on naming things. They took on you know, some beliefs of the settlers and reworked them into their own spiritual beliefs. They, ate, they had names for peaches and pigs and horses and cows. So that's why I don't agree with the geographic name board policy and maybe we can change their minds. So I'm just scrolling down. Shirley again. Uh, Shirley's daughter has been working over the last fortnight with Kim on land mapping at Mataranka. I don't know where that is. How interesting. I'm wondering why I did not know about this research tool before. Huh. Are the massacres along the river included in the work being done by Lyndall Ryan at Newcastle University? Uh, yes, they are. But Lyndall's map is much larger scale. It's across the whole of Australia. So she's put dots on maps, the map at, at in, in on the Hawkesbury um, for the massacres that happened. But we haven't been able to do that because we're working, we're zooming right in. And the places where those massacres happened aren't recorded. I cannot put a dot on a map saying, this is where this massacre happened. I have other dots. We, we have other dots showing where Aboriginal people were killed or settlers were killed in this war of uh, resistance and, and frontiers, but I, we were not able to map the massacres. And I'm, you know, this is disappointing to us, but uh, we just can't put a map, a dot on a map when we don't know where it actually happened. How we've dealt with that is we have explained how those massacres came apart, who were the perpetrators um, and the area that they were loca located in. So it's a different map from Lyndall Ryan's map, which is an important piece of work as well. And Tony, Tony Dawson, Port Macquarie commemorated its bicentenary last week, 200 years since penal settlement was established. The previous, say, 50,000 years was not ignored, but the information is scarce. Yes, I know. <laughs> it's not on the Hawkesbury anymore, though. However, in 1829, 30 to 30, surveyor Ralph recorded a number of Indigenous, oh, place names, how beautiful, without giving their meaning. Some of these are still in use and it would be great to look into them in, in the way that you have done if we had the available resources. Exactly, Tony. That's what I think. I mean, I'm hoping this collaborative project that we've done will, might lead to others. Um, it's just ironic that it happens to be in a place where there are really many names didn't survive. I think there's five, including 
Yaramundi, Bardo Narang, and about three others. But as, as you will all know, many other places in Australia, if you look at the topographic maps, have lots of Aboriginal names. And this project has really convinced me that it is possible to explore those names linguistically and get some idea of what they mean. Now, I don't want to make it too cut and dried. A lot of them are tentative. Language is a slippery thing. We know that. Um, and in many of our words, we have more than one, or maybe even three in one occasion. We have three different glosses. Gloss is just another word for meaning. But when we connected those words and their glosses to the places on the river, often it would fall into place. It, it totally made sense of, of what they were describing as to where they were. Well, Wami makes sense because there's a big cliff with you know caves that look like eyes, and there's a very deep hole at the bottom. So it is, the, and it's also the place where a lot of people drowned. And I, you could do, you can find out by going through Trove. A lot of, uh, I don't know about Aboriginal people, but a lot of settlers drowned there. So you can see why this would have been a warning story to people as well. Well, I mean, there's a monster down there that will drag you in. Um, so can you see what I mean? Like by putting all the things together, not just linguistics on its own, not just history on its own, not, not anything on its own, but by putting things together, geography, history, linguistics, Aboriginal culture, that's when it all fell together. That's what I mean by the magic. I think that's it. That's it. Um, Yay! Fantastic. Um, <laughs> It looks like everybody enjoyed your talks and they've bombarded you with questions. Thank you. That's for great. Time. I'm so happy you did that. There's nothing worse than crickets. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for taking time to answer them, Chris. Um, uh, Grace, really, and we really appreciate you uh, on behalf of the RAHS presenting this talk. Um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me. I was so pleased to do it. Thank you. One day we'll have a face-to-face -face talk. That would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, it looks like I'm, I'm going to I'm going to end the chat now. Uh, okay. And, and um, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful day.